Hello, fellow adventurers. How are you today? <laughs> Sorry that the, uh, the like, off-screen pre-stream setup took just a few minutes longer than I was anticipating. Um, I was trying, I was trying so hard to be ready to actually, like, be on screen at five after. It didn't happen. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, we're here now. Hi, Key Squared. Thank you so much for the resubscription over on the Rogan27 channel. Hi, Fluid Anne. Hi, Lord Portico. Um, hello to everybody who's joining me on either channel um, or in the VODs. Uh, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, otherwise on the internet known as Rogan27, and I am the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, this show is Archival Adventures, where I share materials from special collections and university archives live on the internet, and you get to ask me questions or provide contextual information to what we're looking at. Uh, I generally do not know what the items are that we're going to see, and... Um, such is the case today with the collection that we're gonna we're gonna take a look at today. Um, sorry, I'm just I'm putting a little bit of lotion on at the moment <laughs> while we do the the initial stream stuff. Light buzzing in the background, probably the fan. Uh, if I do this, does it go away? Uh, let me know. And we'll at least have identified it. That did not get rid of it. Is it the music? Or, hmm. There are other possibilities. Um, there was a thing happening with the microphone earlier. Possibly that is happening again. Uh, give me... One second. I'm going to step off screen for one second and uh, see if see if we can isolate the buzzing. Um, I'm just walk over here and see what happens if I do that. Um, hopefully, that will have provided a, an adjustment. Hey, no buzzing. Okay. When I did the audio check, um, the receiver for the wireless microphone uh, turned off the library bees. Why would we want to get rid of the library bees? Um, I presume that library bees is, is actually just an abbreviation for the library bards, and I don't want to get rid of them. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, when I was doing the sound check earlier, it was, uh, uh, there was an electrical hum on the receiver when it was plugged in and um, I've been streaming with it plugged in for weeks so that was a new one. I thought I had uh, found a plug that it wasn't going to do that on but apparently you know I did that check a half an hour ago and things changed so now it's it's unplugged it should survive on its battery just fine. Um, but I turned the fan back on because it is rather warm in here, um, as always, with all of the lights and, and everything. And um, there's no actual air conditioning in this room today because uh, the one air unit um, has switched over and will only blow hot air now. So, you know, that's, that's sort of like a thing. Anyway, um, how about we get this stream underway? I'm just checking to make sure that I have no uh, urgent notifications that are stream relevant, and I don't. So, um, I have too many things sitting around me, too many controls. Ah! Uh, I should get us onto the screen so that we can talk about what we're going to do today on this show. Um, first off, we're going to visit uh, the land acknowledgement and labor recognition the same way we do at the start of every one of these streams. So let me go ahead and pull that up on the screen here and we can take a look at it quickly together. Uh, Virginia Tech's land acknowledgement and labor recognition. I do have um, 
Hey, hey, Hannah, thank you. Uh, and hello, it's good to see you. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their land and waterways. Uh, we further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to advance it. Um, the cursor was not in a good spot for that. Uh, we understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to UTPROSIM, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Uh, and I think that that is, as I, as I often say, very important to pay attention to this. Um, keep it in mind as we move forward. Make sure that we're considering um, the indigenous population um, in all that we're doing and um, inviting them in. Uh, we did a stream a couple weeks ago with some brand new materials um, from the Monacan nation, Monacan tribe. Um, and it was really, really interesting. Uh, we actually learned that it was extremely recently that the tribes in Virginia actually got any sort of recognition. Um, sadly, today we are not looking at anything related to um, indigenous people. Uh, today we are headed to the 20th century for the papers of an astrophysicist. Um, and uh, there. Um, you've got a link there to the finding aid that is currently on screen. Uh, we're going to look at the Thornton L. Page papers. Uh, they cover the time range uh, 1936 to 1983. Um, a total of two boxes for about seven, or sorry, 0.7 cubic feet. Um, and you'll see the abstract here. This collection contains the papers of astronomer Thornton L. Page, including biographical material, drafts, and published versions of papers and texts of speeches. <laughs> Hannah, it's no worry. Um, you are very much appreciated for dropping those commands in when it comes time, but you also are in no way expected to or required to. I, I appreciate it when you're able to, and... Um, That, that's about all. I, I, I don't have any other way of thanking you other than saying thank you. Um, so who was Thornton Page and why should we care? Uh, we have a lovely biographical note here. Most of this is probably going to come from the biography that is, or biographical information that is noted as being in the collection. So. I'm just going to summarize. I'm not going to read word for word here because we'll look at the actual documents in the collection instead. But uh, suffice to say, he was an astrophysicist who... <laughs> Lord Portico, thank you for uh, giving a million points uh, to Hannah. Um, indeed. Thanks a million. And I am Puddle Glum. Thank you also now for the resubscription over on the Rogan 27 channel. It means a lot that you all keep coming back and I appreciate you. 
Um, so, Thornton Page, astrophysicist, uh, worked at a couple of universities. We'll, we'll take a look at the actual documents. The reason this collection is being looked at today is because of his connection to Pearl Harbor. If you were unaware, December 7th is Pearl Harbor Day. Um, I believe it's National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day is the actual title of the holiday. I, I don't know for certain that that's the actual full title, but it's Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, it is the anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor that initiated America's, the United States of America's entry into World War II. Um, that is why we're looking at this collection today. Although this collection has nothing to do with Pearl Harbor, Thornton Page was in the Navy and was serving at Pearl Harbor during the bombing. Um, and when I went searching for any collection that we had that had any connection to Pearl Harbor, this was the only one I found, uh, which ultimately is why this one got selected. Hi, Philip. Thank you so much for being here and for lurking. Um, so that's that's all of the mention of Pearl Harbor that's really going to happen on here. It, it was just a reason to select this collection for today, um, but this collection has truly nothing to do with it beyond the fact that the person whose papers these are was there on the day of the bombing. Um, a lot of what is in this collection from, from what I could tell has to do with Apollo 16 and the far infrared imaging that they did. Uh, so I have a feeling that's most of what we're going to find. Uh, but how about I pull out the boxes, we take a look, we see what's there, and we'll start with the biographical folder so that we know a little bit more about who this person is. Um, I'm gonna just push the button there. Um, oh, and uh, as, a, as just an added bonus and uh, a note for anybody who was here last week, when we were looking at the American Egg Board collection and we ran across all of the things that were stuck together and everything was just sort of in one box together. Um, this is now the American Egg Board collection for anybody who was here last week. Uh, it is now in folders, in a box, and where items were still sticky after removing adhesives, they, they got little pieces of paper between them now. Um, because the end of last week, I reprocessed the collection. I added more description and I um, put it into folders and, and it hadn't been touched since 2009 and, and now it'll be easier to use. <laughs> Um, yes, Philip, uh, for acrylic, for documents, no, neither. For, for documents, we would need a professional conservator to determine how to get rid of the adhesive off of the documents. Um, but I, I have recently been cleaning acrylic display stands and removing old adhesive from them. And yes, I discovered that isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, worked much better than Goo Gone. Uh, that's nothing against that brand name. Um, it's just that the alcohol worked better at getting that old adhesive off of the acrylic stands I was working with. Um, so, the Thornton Page papers. Uh, we've got two boxes, one of them this, this sort of half or it's not even half. It's like a third of the size of one of the full-size banker boxes. And then the other one is half the size of, of the first one. So relatively small, but you can fit a lot of documents in these boxes. Oof. Uh, we're going to start with the folder Biographical Material and Photograph. 
because why not? Let's learn about who this person is. Um, we appear to have a biography, an actual like typed biography here. Uh, so let's start with that. That seems a, as good a place to start as any, right? I'm gonna move this keyboard out of the way. And I'm gonna zoom in. And remember, um, oh, hang on. I don't have control of the camera. Give me one second while I gain control of the camera. Um, the screen went to sleep and I forgot. Um, and when the screen goes to sleep, I lose control of the camera. And we have done everything we can conceivably think of to tell this computer not to put the screen to sleep. And it still puts the screen to sleep. All right, here we go. Thornton Lee Page, 1913 to 19, which is not the dates of his life. He, he did not die at six years of age. I don't know what that, I think this is a biography covering those years. Um, Thornton Page was born was born in 1913, died in 1996. I think they just didn't complete the, um, the date there. Maybe this was written before he died. Um, <laughs> on 13 August, 1913, Mary Thornton Page and Lee Page an instructor in physics at Yale University, had their first child. Yeah, yeah, key squared, you got there. You, you understood it, that it was probably like 19XX and they were just leaving it blank to fill in a death date. Um, uh, had their first child in New Haven, Connecticut, Mary Thornton, uh, daughter of an English rancher in Colorado, was trained as a nurse before her marriage. Lee Page was on the Yale faculty from 1910 until his death in 1952. Young Thornton attended the Worthington Hooker Public Grammar School from 1919 to 1926, New Haven High School from 1926 to 1930, and Yale University from 1930 to 1934, when he received his Bachelor of Science degree with highest honors. In 32-33, he took his father's course, Physics 100, in which Lee Page trained all the physics graduate students at that time. Young Page had an advantage over the other students because he had previously been assigned by his father the task of checking numerical answers to the problems in the galley proofs of Lee Page's textbook, Introduction to Theoretical Physics, but he received no other favors. Um, so I'm just going to note right there, that's a huge advantage. Like. He helped his dad edit the textbook that his dad had written that, of course, was the textbook for the class being taught by his dad, because when professors write textbooks, they then go on to make their students buy them and use them in class. So huge advantage, but also, I mean, Physics 100, probably a required course for whatever he was doing, and any student who had previously like worked on the mathematics uh, from the example problems in the textbook would have had a similar advantage. It's just that what other students would have been doing that work in advance? Not very many. Uh, anyway, while at Yale, Thornton Page was known as TL and helped found the Yale Outing Club of which he was president for two years and especially enjoyed hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, where his parents had a summer home near those of P.W. Bridgman. I have no idea who P.W. Bridgman is, uh, but apparently he was associated with Harvard. And J.Q. Stewart, again, another person I do not know who they are, uh, who is apparently associated with Princeton. He 
sang tenor in the Yale Glee Club and took part in two student productions of Gilbert and Sullivan musicals, The Mikado and Pirates of Penzance. Um, this interest in singing was later continued at Oxford near Houston. Also developed an early interest in astronomy, taking two undergraduate courses from Dirk Brower at Yale and observing occultations of stars with an old 12-inch telescope on the Yale campus. I'm going to skip some of this because this is a very, it, it is, it is, it is a glorious thing to be an astrophysicist pirate king. <laughs> Key squared. Um, good try there. I don't think it really fits the meter, but who cares? Um, yeah, I'm going to skip some of this because this is a, this is a 14 page biography. And most of it is not relevant to what we're going to look at today. So let me, let me see here. Uh, spring of 34. Apparently went to Europe. Oh, that's interesting. At Oxford, uh, he took residence in uh, Magdalen College, which I don't know enough about Oxford to know it's Magdalen College and its history, but uh, decided to work for a Doctor of Philosophy in Astrophysics under Professor H. H. Plaskett. He took courses with E. A. Milne, um, heard lectures by Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Edwin Hubble, and A. H. Compton. Like, those are some names. He learned from some of like science's big, big celebrities, uh, worked on a thesis on the spectra of planetary nebulae, uh, the spectra taken by Plaskett at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory with the 72 inch reflector uh, were microphotometered and carefully measured to check the physical conditions in four nebulae. Uh, Page obtained laboratory spectra of hydrogen using the equipment of Derek Jackson in the old Clarendon Laboratory and presented his results at a meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society, which elected him a fellow. His examiners, I don't know that we care, but R.H. Fowler and E.A. Milne um, was awarded his Doctor of Philosophy in 38. Apparently was wearing a bright red academic gown. I suppose that paints a picture of a graduation. I don't know how relevant it is when you're, I, I don't know. I have not studied the art of writing biographies. So I don't know how much of that tiny little detail, like a bright red academic gown is truly necessary in a biography. Um, if anybody has studied about writing biographies, I'd be curious about that. Um, Apparently, his, uh, his faculty advisor person, Plaskett, disapproved of his extracurricular activities, uh, especially those with the boat club. It didn't like him rowing, apparently. Well, and bump suppers with too much beer. I can understand the professor not liking those, but I didn't like him rowing. Uh, do, 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 do. So he was known in apparently like English academic society. Uh, 1938, the University of Chicago was rapidly developing under the leadership of Robert M. Hutchins. Page's job, so he took a job at um, university, uh, sorry, up at the very top of what's visible there, 1938. Shortly before traveling to Chicago, where Thornton had been appointed instructor in astronomy. So, um, University of Chicago was rapidly developing under the leadership of Robert Hutchins. Uh, Page's job, a half year teaching on the campus in Chicago under the supervision of Dean Walter Bart Bartke. Uh, and a half year of observing and research at the Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, 90 miles away. Otto Struve director of the Yerkes Observatory had collected a remarkable group of astronomers, including uh, Gerard Kuiper, uh, Jesse Greenstein, 
Louis Haney, uh, Hen, Louis, Louis Henye, uh, S. Chandra Sakar, um, I don't remember for certain. I think it's Sridhar Chandra Sakar for the astronomer, but I could be mistaken about the first name there. Um, Bent Stromgren, W. W. Morgan, Philip Keenan, and Carl Seifert. Page was most impressed with Georges van Biesbrecht. Sharp-eyed observer of comets, planets, and double stars. It's still a thing with physics professors today. Grad students with hobbies are spending time not in the lab. A lot of folks in the field think it should be your whole life. Yeah, that's most fields, sadly. See also why I switched to education rather than, uh, <laughs> rather than just research. All right, uh, let's see where we can advance this story a little bit. At least a house. Now he's under Struve instead of under Plaskett. Teaching on campus in Chicago was uneventful and somewhat dull, but all this came to an end for Page with the start of World War II. He volunteered to lecture in favor of the, quote, destroyer deal, unquote, with Great Britain and accepted an invitation from the U.S. Navy engineered by Yale professor uh, Louis McKeon, commander U.S. Naval Reserves, to work at the Naval Ordnance Lab in Washington on magnetic mines and countermeasures. This started a second career for Page, which lasted for more than 15 years. It first required moving Helen and baby Tanya to southeast Washington, just behind the Anacostia Hospital for the... Uh, yep, historical terms. I, I'm just gonna say uh, the Anacostia Hospital for people in need of a little bit of assistance. Uh, <laughs> you all can see what the words are on the screen there. Um, where they were wakened every moonlit night by apparently loud people inside the hospital. Um, and the biographer is noting that the loudness caused by the bright moonlight um, amongst the mentally disturbed people housed within the hospital uh, is the purported etymology of the word lunatic. Um, but yeah, men, uh, 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 historical terms here. <laughs> Just gonna avoid passing judgment and especially using that R word. Uh, jewelry instructors are not that way. They very much expect you to do, uh, to have hobbies and things. Yeah, I mean, those would be good to have. What happened? Did the command not work? I don't know. I don't know. There. Yeah, I know it worked for you on the other channel. I don't know why it didn't work for you on this channel. Who knows? But it's there now. Um, all right. At the Naval Ordnance Lab. Assembled a group of competent scientists, including John Bardeen, a later Nobel Prize winner. This is like name dropping left and right in this biography. Uh, <laughs> David Catcher, later first editor of Physics Today. Incidentally, a magazine I once subscribed to, even though I was not good at physics. Um, I just thought it was fascinating. Uh, let's see. First job was to seek countermeasures to magnetic sea mines just being used by the Germans against ships in British water. Um, Page helped develop degaussing coils that reduced the magnetic field of a steel ship and devices to change the current in these coils as the ship changed heading and moved from one magnetic latitude to another. He also collected data on ship traffic around the world showing where sea mines would be effective for military blockade. 
For some reason, this study angered the higher military administrators, and Page was quickly dispatched to London to report on British mine countermeasures, such as sweeping with long electric conductors towed by wooden ships. At that time, London was under German bomber attack, and there was severe rationing of meat and eggs. Page reported all the British magnetic mine countermeasures and fell under the spell of Patrick Blackett, who was working on anti-submarine warfare. Page worked with Blackett and Edward Bullard on tracking German U-boats, foiling their attacks on U.S. convoys and sinking them by destroyer attacks with depth charges and newly developed hedgehogs that threw depth charges forward. I've never heard of hedgehogs. Interesting. Um, he returned to the Naval Ordnance Lab. Uh to work on how to, uh, on trigger sensitivities for deep water mines, or sea bottom mines, let's see. Uh, Johnson, Page, and Bardeen organized a group to study this question by using what they called war games, trials of a given mine designed against, uh, d a given mine design, I, against assumed enemy tactics in specific harbors of military interest. This group met on weekends and on 4 December 1941 played a game in the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. It showed that mines could be decisive in bottling up U.S. ships there. Three days later, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, but used no mines. Johnson was there and recognized that war in the Pacific opened up many possibilities for using mines. He called for Wallace Page and others to be enrolled as naval officers and sent out to Oahu. Uh, Page was trained for six weeks at Dartmouth, where he helped teach navigation, became a lieutenant junior grade uh, in the U.S. Naval Reserves, and then flew to San Francisco to join a convoy for Honolulu. On the way, he helped navigate the convoy and was the only navigator to recognize that it had, quote, passed under the sun. Unquote, correcting a navigational error of about 100 nautical miles. At Pearl Harbor, uh, Johnson and Page attempted to convince Admiral Nimitz um, that sea mines could defeat the Japanese. Uh, it took three years and several attempts with carrier-based torpedo planes, but Ellis Johnson finally won since uh, pack baking of a major mine-laying campaign. Anyway. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Uh, so he was involved. Let's see. He, Page, and others set up a large mine depot on uh, Tinian from which the bombers took over 12,000 mines laid in the Inland Sea and uh, Shimonoseki Straits virtually... Um, Disabling Japanese shipping as blockade by itself would have ended the war, but Washington was out of touch. Uh, and then the attacks happened on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Probably backing, yes. I, I looked at it, it said baking, and it didn't make any sense. But anyway. Uh, so he was in the region and actively doing stuff around Pearl Harbor around the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And then he was in the region and doing things around Japan around the time of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, a page after the war ended had to clean up all the mines in Japanese waters. Uh, he was in Tokyo for the surrender ceremonies. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. After a, a year of cleaning up the mines that they had put in uh, the Inland Sea, um, accompanied a Navy, Navy admiral to observe the Crossroads atomic bomb tests at Bikini Atoll. <clears throat> So it present for a lot of like sort of major events. In the summer of 1946, Page was retired as a commander in the US, US Naval Reserves and returned to Chicago to take up teaching in the college course Physical Sciences 3, where he met Lou Williams, a woman geologist. 
uh, I believe that's just called a geologist. Um, Thornton and Lou were enchanted with one another. Good for them. Uh, let's see. This is me skimming, because I know there's important stuff in here, but there's a lot of flavor text that we don't necessarily need. Um, Thornton worked at uh, Yerkes part-time and at the new McDonald Observatory founded by Otto Struve near Fort Davis, Texas. He obtained spectra of double galaxies that showed the average mass of a galaxy is 2 times 10 to the 10th solar masses for a spiral and 60 times 10 to the 10th solar masses for an elliptical galaxy. At the same time, Carl Seifert identified several galaxies with intense nuclei, now called Seifert galaxies. Otto Struve became unpopular with others at Yerkes, but celebrated St. Patrick's Day as O Struve uh, with the pages in Chicago. Uh, Greenstein moved to Caltech, Henye to Berkeley, and Struve to the new NSF Radio Observatory in West Virginia. Uh, the Pages had a daughter, Marianne, and later a son, Lee Page II. At the Chicago campus, Thornton and Lou got to know da, 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 uh, name dropping of Harold Urey, Enrico Fermi, Saunders McLean. Um, <laughs> oh, hi, Iron Trout. Welcome back. Thank you for the resubscription. Uh... All right. Oh, here. Maybe this last sentence is useful. At Yerkes, uh, Thornton reorganized the astronomical slide and print collection and worked with the shop foreman, Carl Riddell, and the optician, uh, Fred Pearson, to build the fast B spectrograph for the prime focus of the McDonald 82 inch telescope. He visited the Lick Observatory and became close friends with Nick Mayle, gaining new ideas about galaxies and their spectra. In 1950, Page rejoined Ellis Johnson as deputy director of the operations research office just north of Washington organized by Johnson for the Department of the Army and operated by the Johns Hopkins University. Johnson had already collected a staff of 40 physical scientists, mathematicians, economists, social scientists, historians, psychologists, geographers, and political scientists, including George Petty, who was assistant director. ORO had a list of over 100 consultants and several subcontractors. Page became one of five division chiefs, each with three ongoing army projects. He supervised operations research studies of guerrilla warfare and use of mi military intelligence and the integration of uh, black troops, historical terms, um, I didn't say the word that's actually on the page, uh, the first two classified top secret. For eight years, Page traveled extensively to army bases in the U.S., spent six months in Korea studying artillery, and four years in Heidelberg, West Germany, as science advisor to the commanding general U.S. Army Europe. He wrote reports on improving the accuracy of artillery fire, on communication systems in ground warfare, and on countermeasures to intercontinental ballistic missiles. <sighs> McDonald Observatory may sound familiar for their production of the Stardate Observatory news segments of, on NPR. I did not know that key squared, but uh, I definitely did recognize the name of the um, observatory. I just didn't have a connection as to why. And I was also, during that segment, distracted by the NSF radio telescope in West Virginia because I used to live right next to it. Um. All right. Lots of military stuff here. Um. Do, 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 do. Uh. In several joint meetings, ORO and RAND staff members shared data and ideas, producing two separate reports that modified U.S. nuclear policy, adding the hotline telephone between the White House and the Kremlin. At that time, the U.S. was well ahead of the USSR in the arms race. Later, Page changed his views on nuclear policy in favor of arms reduction and became anti-nuke in, in 1983. Um, let's see, what else, what else stands out here? They apparently vacationed in Germany. Uh, 
visited NATO headquarters, visited England and Ireland by way of Copenhagen, Stockholm, and Oslo to attend the 1955 meeting of the International Astronomical Union in Belfast. Um, visited the Berlin Wall in 1956. He was also able to purchase Rommel's 1938 Mercedes convertible by offering his old Buick convertible to any GI who could locate a classic Mercedes for sale. It was located in Mannheim near Heidelberg and acquired for $2,000 with a crate of spare parts and a reserve engine. That is a... Okay, I, that I think makes sense as something that's in a bi biography. Uh, what? <laughs> this biography reads like fiction. Uh, the pages had reservations for car, dog, pet crow, two German servants, and themselves on the ill-fated Italian liner Andrea Doria. But they were cancelled through an army administrative error, so the family was spared the tragedy of the Andrea Doria sinking after a collision off the Massachusetts coast. Instead, they arrived in New York safely on the Cristoforo Colombo a week later and drove to Washington. Like, at Pearl Harbor. In Japan... At, during the nuclear bombings, at Bikini Atoll, at, uh, like, narrowly misses uh, being on the Andrea Doria. This is an event-filled uh, narration. Had dis Paige had re decided to return to astronomical research and teaching and accepted an appointment as professor of astronomy at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. After hurriedly selling their house in Washington and arranging for moving books, papers, and furniture to Middletown, the Pages moved into a 1758 house owned by the university with a back apartment suitable for Lou's parents. Uh, for anybody who's not in the United States, any house dating back to 1758 is like unbelievably old in United States terms. That is a house from the beginning of time um, when looking at it from the perspective of an American. Uh, I understand that in Europe, Asia, Africa, basically most of the world that is not America, 1758 isn't that long ago. <clears throat> Academic life was a big change from the mobile military life in Europe. Really? With all the battles that happened between professors on campus? Uh, but Paige took over from retiring Carl Stearns as department chairman and director of the Van Vleck Observatory and looked for three or four young astronomers to build up the staff. Beside astronomy courses, he taught a, se a selection of a joint humanities course required of all freshmen, and organized a similar course in the sciences, including physics, chemistry, geology, and astronomy. Uh, so basically, at Wesleyan helped to um, design a core general education course in the sciences, is what I take away from that. I'm looking for the sciencey things that were actually interested in here. Ah! Okay, this is part of why I was looking at this biography, because when I did a little googling of this person, I found this, and it wasn't in the Finding Aid biography. <clears throat> oh, let's see. <sighs> Page raised eyebrows by offering the first university course on flying saucers, which worked well in attracting 20 students who would otherwise have taken no course in physical science. He got them to understand astronom astronom astronomical coordinate systems, motions of the moon, planets, and stars, and apparitions such as moon dogs and novae. Uh, 
The students used a telescope and wrote term papers, the best three of which were published in a 25-cent booklet. The best three students debated on the Hartford radio station, Do UFOs Exist? All this later led to the 1971 AAAS Symposium on UFOs in Boston, the basis of a book, UFOs, A Scientific Debate, edited by Sagan and Page. Uh, Page worked part-time on the operations research for the United Aircraft... Oh, sorry, Page worked part-time on operations research uh, for the United Aircraft Corporation in East Hartford and was severely hurt in an automobile accident while returning to Middletown in December 1961. Um, <clears throat> he ultimately ended up losing his right eye as a result of that accident. In 1964, he was invited to teach in the astronomy department at UCLA, where he knew more name-dropping. Uh, Page spent two years on leave from Wesleyan at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, he requested and got funds to modernize the 61-inch reflector at the... Cordoba Observatory in Argentina, and made five trips there to help with the installation of new electrical controls, a new fast spectrograph, which he designed and built. Uh, so do, 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 do. <laughs> if you want me to read more in detail on any of these sections, let me know. Otherwise, I'm trying to jump to more interesting bits. Um... But since I have not read it before, uh, I'm skimming it while I'm doing that. In 1969, Page pr proposed to NASA putting a far ultraviolet camera on the moon to study stars, nebulae, and galaxies during the Apollo series of missions. He had picked the Naval Research Lab far UV camera designed and built by George Carruthers, uh, who had also proposed its use to study ge geo corona and stars. It was agreed, after NASA's suggestion, that uh, NRL, sorry, the Naval Research Laboratory, NRL, rather than Wesleyan University, be the contractor, Carruthers, the principal investigator, and Page, the co-investigator. In 1968, Page had been invited by Carl Heinz uh, to lecture on astronomy to the astronauts at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. He was offered an NRC research associateship there, which he welcomed, starting a 15-year spree in space science. After the NRC fellowship ran out in 1970, Page remained in Houston, but was paid by NRL to continue working with MSC on the far UV camera, now known as the S-201 experiment. He made fre frequent visits to NRL in Washington, helping the project engineer William Conway to meet NASA test requirements tested the effect of the camera's strong magnetic field on the astronaut's wrist watch, and planned how to meet the camera's requirements of very low humidity before launch and no high temperature on the moon. As co-investigator, Page's main contribution was selecting 15 targets in the sky that would be above the lunar horizon at the scheduled mission time and calculating pointing angles for the astronaut, John Young, to set on the camera's azimuth circles. The camera was an electrograph in which light from a 20 degree circle in the sky was focused on a KBR, photocathode. I know we've seen this abbreviation before. I do not remember what it means. Um, I'm going to find out though. Nope. I, not the engineering company, please. All right, let's. What does it mean? Uh, potassium bromide. I was like, I knew it was a chemical composition. I didn't remember what those chemicals were off the top of my head. Um, the uh, let's see. 
focused on a potassium bromide photocathode requiring low humidity um, at minus 25,000 volts, from which photoelectrons were focused by an axial magnetic field of 300 Gauss onto a thin layer of nuclear track emulsion. Once the camera was pointed and a start button pressed, it went through an automatic sequence of exposures operated by three electric motors requiring no high temperature. The photocathode was, quote, blind, uh, unquote, to wavelengths longer than 1600 astronomical degrees and changeable filters restricted the band pass to 1050 to 1600 astronomical degrees or 1,250 to 1,600 astronomical degrees. There was also an objective grading allowing spectra to be recorded from 1050 to 1,600 astronomical degrees or everything below 1,600 uh, with no filter. There were tense moments in mission control at Houston where Carruthers and Page waited out a six-hour delay in the Apollo 16 uh, lunar module landing. This increased the sun altitude and decreased the shadow of the lunar module in which the S-201 camera was to be deployed. With the camera closer to the lunar module, a larger portion of the sky was eliminated, but the S-201 camera photographed 10 targets, including the Earth and Geocorona, the large Magellanic Cloud, the center of our galaxy, and other fields of stars and galaxies at both low and high galactic latitude. The film holder was returned to Earth and the film processed at MSC. Many copies and prints were made, and Page used the PDS microdensitometer at the Baller and Shivens plant in South Pasadena, California to scan each of 207 frames with a resolution of... Yeah, I don't need all those details. Um, I'm sure some people would be interested in that, though. Uh, let's see. Similar camera was on Skylab. So, <clears throat> working with NASA on that. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, I don't know. I think this author worked really hard to just work in, like, everything into this. And I don't need all of it. There was mention of um, Mao Zedong and uh, Tiananmen Square on the previous page. But not because Page did anything important there. He just vacationed and they saw those. Um... <laughs> Uh, another holiday trip. Interesting, it's not in here. I'm, I'm intrigued by what is not in this biography. Uh, <clears throat> beside the S-201 data analysis, three other topics occupied Page in his retirement years. The first started in 1976 when Tom uh, Giuli, principal scientist for the joint U.S.-U.S.S.R. Apollo-Soyuz mission, arranged for the Pages to write nine educational pamphlets on the mission and its scientific experiments. In order to make these useful to teachers, the Pages recruited a group of 20 high school science teachers from all around the country and paid them to review the drafts to suggest improvements, which included adding a glossary of terms questions and answers, and helpful diagrams. Uh, the, that would certainly be useful. Let's see. Second topic, also for improving public understanding of NASA projects, was Space Telescope, scheduled to be launched from the shuttle in 1986. <clears throat> 86 would have been the um, Space Shuttle Challenger, um, and so that probably didn't work out. <clears throat> uh, let's see.
I'm skimming, skimming, skimming. Yeah, so he worked on a an item that was supposed to go up on the shuttle challenger. <clears throat> if if the camera takes pictures in space, does it click? I don't know. Camera go into space, make clickety noise. Come home with pretty pictures. Hi, Detective Zen. That's about it. Yeah, I think. Um, the third activity was in support of Mrs. Iva L. Scott, who was in charge of external communications for the Johnson Space Center Office of Public Affairs. Among other things, Scotty had to answer letters asking NASA questions or giving NASA advice on everything from new experiments in space to the heat-resistant tiles on the shuttle orbiter. In answer to Scotty's requests, Paige wrote out answers matching to the questioner's level of understanding and found it an interesting challenge to maintain the interest of youngsters and oldsters in the space effort. He collected a small library of booklets and pamphlets as sources and suggested handouts. In May 1983, he prepared a summary handout for questioners interested in the solar system, including the latest data on the sun, planets, moons, asteroids, and comets. On Mrs. Scott's retirement in July 1983, he applied for her job. At the insistence of Houston reporter Luther Rousey, Lou and Thornton Page agreed in June 1983 to edit a newspaper column, Astrofax, which Rousey hoped to syndicate nationwide and used to disseminate astronomical data correcting astrology columns. Yes, I said astrology in that final sentence. Yeah, a lot of things probably didn't work with the Challenger. Yeah. Um... So, this says complete to June 1983. Um, I'm quite intrigued. Because there is no mention, and now I have to check the dates, but there is no mention of one of the things he is most known for. which happened in the 1950s. So this is not complete because back in the pages on the 50s, there was no mention of the Robertson panel, of which he was a member. Again, those papers aren't in this collection. This collection is mostly academic papers, but the person, Thornton Page, was a member of the Robertson panel, uh, which if you are unfamiliar, the Robertson panel was a scientific committee which met in January 1953, headed by Howard P. Robertson. The panel arose from a recommendation to the Intelligence Advisory Committee in December 1952 from a Central Intelligence Agency review of the U.S. Air Force investigation into Unidentified Flying Objects, Project Blue Book. The CIA review itself was in response to widespread reports of unidentified flying objects, especially in the Washington, D.C. area during the summer of 1952. The panel was briefed on U.S. military activities and intelligence, uh, hence the report was originally classified secret. Later declassified, the Robertson panel's report concluded that UFOs were not a direct threat to national security, but could pose an indirect threat by overwhelming standard military communications due to public interest in the subject. Most UFO reports, they concluded, could be explained as misidentification of mundane aerial objects, and the remaining minority could, in all likelihood, be similarly explained with further study. The Robertson panel recommended that a public education campaign should be undertaken in order to reduce public interest in the subject, minimizing the risk of swamping air defense systems with reports at critical times, and that civilian UFO groups should be monitored. Uh, the Robertson panel's report was contained within a larger internal CIA report by F.C. Durant, a CIA, CIA officer who served as secretary to the panel, which summarizes the activities of the panel and its conclusions. This wider document, commonly referred to as the Durant Report. Um, <clears throat> so, his biography does not mention that he served on the Robertson panel as part of the CIA, like it, it like under the auspices of the central of the CIA, um, studying available evidence about 
UFOs. There's no mention of it anywhere in the biography. We should monitor the UFO groups. Use one of those disc-shaped drones to track them. <laughs> Detective Zen. Um, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah. As an astronomer for the ORO, Operations Research Office, which we read about part of his time working with the ORO, um, he became embroiled in the controversy involving unidentified flying objects in 1953. That's all it says. I would, I would need to track down the source for that one. Um, it does have a linked source, because it's Wikipedia that I, I was reading the part about the Robertson panel from. Anywho, that was a lot of time spent getting to know the person whose papers these are. How about we, uh, we take a look at some of the things, the papers themselves. Um, like I said, there's not really going to be any Robertson panel stuff in here. There's not really going to be any... Um, Uh, specifically, like, the war stuff. Uh, but there is some NASA stuff. Which should be pretty interesting. Recent publications by Thornton Page. I'm assuming this page is sometime from the 1970s, uh, given that recent includes 1970 through 1978. Um... Astronaut capabilities for scientific observations. Spectral lines and radial velocities of galaxies in pairs. Men in Space, Chapter 10, in Human Futuristics. The cameras on the moon. Mercury. The third Lunar Science Conference, Sky and Telescope Magazine. Apollo 16, Far UV Camera slash Spectrograph Earth Observations with George Carruthers. In Science. Structure of the Coma Cluster of Galaxies. Uh, far UV Camera Spectrograph Experiment S201. UFOs, A Scientific Debate, edited with Carl Sagan. Binary Galaxies, Chapter 16 in Galaxies and the Universe. Apollo Soyuz, Experiments in Space, Nine Pamphlets with Lou Williams Page. The S201 Catalog of Far UV Objects. S201 Far UV Atlas of Large Magellanic Cloud, and Space Science and Astronomy, Escape from Earth, by Macmillan, which is a major textbook publisher. I'm not going to read this entire list, um, because I didn't realize this whole page is a supplemental list. Be like, wow. Um, yeah. Here's the photo that is mentioned in, in the folder title. A photograph of Thornton Page. <laughs> uh, I believe this is the only photograph of Page in the collection. I know there are more interesting and better photographs of him that you can find online. Uh, Wesleyan, where he was a professor, has uh, some materials of his as well. And um, they have a whole website that, talk, that like focuses on his association with UFOs. Um, the materials that we have are primarily associated with his work with NASA, which is unsurprising because we have a lot of materials from um, NASA astronauts and NASA administrators and uh, so, yeah. I'm, I'm certain we only have these because of the NASA connection. Uh, ooh, a routing slip from NASA. Mail code VPI, which stands for Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Interesting that NASA has a mail code for our, for our school. I did not know that. Um, 
it doesn't really surprise me now that I know, but I just, I didn't know. Uh, Glenn L. McMillan. McMullen? I don't know. Here are four additions to my papers you are preserving. Uh, this top one... describes no yeah wow the top one describes a Rhodes Scholar reunion in Oxford last June and the other three are research papers on surveys of blue stars detected in four regions of the sky with the s201 far UV camera on the Apollo 16 mission to the moon And that was apparently sent to us in October of 1983 by Thornton Page. Um, but... <clears throat> These are like quotes to be added onto things. I am uncertain. I would have to spend more time and, and really dig into the collection to figure out where Paige intended those things to go. Um, anyway, <laughs> we spent a lot of time with that folder, huh? Uh, but we know a little bit about him. All right, uh, next we have printed material, A through, Z through R. I don't know exactly what that's going to be. Uh, oh, no, A through Z. The rest of this folder is printed material, A through Z. Silver lining, free manila folder. What? These aren't just manila folders. Hi, B Open Sky, though. Uh, uh, or uh, These are... Acid-free archival folders. Really interesting thing to find in your day. Oh, be open sky. We're not done though, <laughs> but um, but you're welcome. You're more than welcome. Um, I know there's text of some speeches from him in the second box, um, and I may end up going there because I always find that sort of interesting. <clears throat> Whereas, like these will be fine. These like articles that. Uh, this whole first box is filled out by copies of articles written by him. Those can be really interesting. I find speeches to be more interesting personally. Um, astronomic... Or, it's not astronomic. This is an article for the American Astronautical Society titled Astronaut Capabilities for Scientific Observations, written by Thornton Page. <laughs> oh, Iron Trout, that means a lot. Um, I need to... I don't know how to do it. <laughs> anyway. No, I, it, that, mean, that means quite a lot that, um, that you find this one of your favorite streams to watch. I was going to put a little tag in there so that I would, because let's be honest, I should, I should make note of when people say nice things. Ooh, how do I do that? No. Sorry. Now, now I've gotten distracted by doing something that I didn't mean to do. Unpin. I didn't mean to pin it. I will hydrate. Thank you, Lord Portico. Um, I was trying to timestamp it, and I don't know how to do that. It's, it's not a big deal. I will find it later if I need it. Yeah, yeah, 
I don't remember. Anyway. What in the world? Apologies. You all couldn't see the thing that just shocked me. The computer that gives me control of the camera. Are you? Are you being truthful with me now, computer? I have no control over the um, uh, the camera that is showing you the documents. Oh no, Iron Tra- it's fine. What is going on? Um, this computer has lost its connection to the internet, which means I cannot control that camera right now. Okay. Hold one second while I try to connect via Wi-Fi instead of the wired connection. That has functioned. I don't know why the wired connection um, quit, but I, I did struggle to get the wired connection even set up on this computer today. Um, in fact, both computers. <laughs> the, the ethernet ports in this room seemed to not be stable today. No idea why. <clears throat> it's unusual. I just want to check and make sure that the um, captions are functioning and then we can move on. Well, that and also make sure that I have control over the camera. It's not even them, Iron Trout. I know, I know that um, on my, uh, my normal, uh, on my gaming streams at home, we have internet problems because there's instability on the internet line there. This is completely different supplier, completely, and usually on campus it's not an issue. Um, okay, but seriously, there are some, oh gosh, that's not even going to, no, it, it won't work because it's wireless. Well, we, we're stuck at this zoom level. I can't change the camera zoom level because I can't connect to those without a wired connection through specific IP addresses um, and specific ethernet ports. And uh, I believe those ethernet ports are only that side of the room and not this side of the room. Um, so I don't actually think that it's possible for me to control the camera right now. Well, that's an... Have I tried turning it off and on again? Um, oh, I... I don't know if it would work for the camera, which is the thing that I'm worried about. I could VPN and get access that way. Um, so... <laughs> yeah, I don't know why the LAN ports aren't working. Hi, was not worth it. Uh, I just saw that it was you. Uh, I'm, I'm vamping for a second while I try to figure out what to do um, and if I can get access through... What is the address? I just... Why did the internet go away? I am crossing my fingers. Rest the document on something higher. I mean, I could also stand up and try pushing buttons on the camera itself. Um, I'm just really confused right now. This is quite unusual. Okay, but seriously? 
Anyway, uh, we're, we're at, I mean, it's not a terrible zoom level. Anyway, uh, astronaut capabilities for scientific observations. I don't know why I had this one turned to the side. I guess it seemed interesting to me when I was looking for an image to use for this, uh, for promotional materials. <gasps> Ooh. The, uh, I'm looking here for, for a start. The question of man's value on space missions has at least three dimensions, political, economic, and scientific. Each dimension has positive and negative aspects, and the relative value of each aspect is set by priorities or weights that are difficult to evaluate. One high-level source of priorities is the report to President Nixon by the Space Task Group, also discussed in References 2-4, to uh, which gave high priority to manned exploration of the solar system, to surveys of Earth resources, and to the collection of purely scientific data. The logical basis for assigning high priority to, quote, manned exploration, unquote, is well stated in that report, although it can also be said that several scientific goals, as well as the use of men aboard spacecraft, have high, quote, political appeal, unquote, which cannot be ignored and may justify higher costs. Whether or not the appeal is shared by the scientific community, uh, this appeal was well demonstrated by the, quote, first small step, unquote, on the moon. There is high political appeal also in the subject of exploration of Mars. In the search for extraterrestrial life, in studies of the formation and early history of the Earth and solar system, and in studies of unusual phenomena, pulsars, neutron stars, supernovae, and very distant objects, quasars, that have caught the public fancy. The use of non-U.S. astronauts, as recommended in the Space Task Group report, will have added international political appeal. All of that makes sense. Um, yeah. I'm going to see what happens. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what's buzzing my wrist? It was the um, two-factor authentication for uh, signing into VPN on this computer. And I'm just going to see if that lets me access... at least one of the controls. I don't think it's going to. Um. This is one of the one of the problems with running this stream. Uh, technically, running this stream by myself, I don't have anybody else in the room to try and troubleshoot the problems that are happening. What I find particularly interesting is that the site that I'm trying to access v through the VPN on my computer, which is connected to a LAN port, I'm able to access downstairs at my desk just fine. Doesn't want to work right now. Uh, Be Open Sky, um, I could potentially. Uh, The, the main problem with um, trying... Aha! I don't know what's different. But the wired connection is working again. Uh, well, at least it says it's working. We'll see if it actually ends up connecting to the camera. Just run between my desk and here. Right, right, right. That sounds perfectly reasonable-ish. I'm going to move this. If, if nobody objects, 
I'm gonna skip to the speeches folder because I find those to be particularly interesting when looking at some of these things. I can flip through random published articles, but like printed material A, B, C, D, on through Z doesn't really mean a lot to me. Uh, there's nothing about those folder titles that really catches my eye. Um, it does look like they are just the publications um, from page in those folders. Uh, <clears throat> box two has drafts. So I'm guessing these are the draft manuscripts for um, the articles that he was writing, which not a bad thing to have. Okay, but you said the internet worked. Um, just reloading the captions once more. <laughs> Uninstall and reinstall the mods. I know this game is, is giving me such problems. Oh wait, this isn't a game. This is... This is Archives. Wait, Archives is a game. Well, sort of. Uh, speaking of computer issues, you usually play Valheim with some game mods and you just had to uninstall and reinstall to get them working again. Because you couldn't build. Oh gosh, that, that would be a severe limitation in uh, Valheim. I wonder if we... L no, because the stream would have gone down if that happened. <laughs> it disappears and reappears. I was, I was speculating for a moment, wondering if um, that whole port had gone out, but that is the Ethernet port that connects... the thing that's running the stream. So if it had, if it was the whole port, uh, we would have lost the stream, and we didn't. So, um... <gasps> Yay! Sorry. I have camera control again! Um, incidentally, we bought this camera because uh, the website said that there was a remote. It came with a remote. can't use the remote without spending an additional like $500 to make the remote work with the camera. The camera came with a remote. We bought it because it had a remote and then discovered <laughs> that making the remote work was gonna cost a heck of a lot more money. Uh, which is why I have to sign into a, a website to control the camera um, or stand up and push buttons um, because the remote control um, is non-functional without spending uh, many hundreds of more dollars. Which we would like to eventually do because it would make it function better. But also we hadn't budgeted for that. Uh, yeah, Puddle Glum. Anyway. Uh, but I do have backend access from here. I can actually manage to... Because all I need is to control the zoom. I just need to be able to zoom in. And the website does that, but I have to be able to access the website in order to do that. Or I have to find where those buttons are uh, to push the buttons on a camera that's above my head. Not the greatest. All right, this letter from 30 June 1981 to Anthony Martoccia, contra contracting officer, NASA headquarters code HWC-2. And I saw your note there, uh, Detective Zen. Imagine losing the stream during Rogan's show. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> it's happened many times. Just not on this show, usually. Via Richard Baldwin, JSC. Yeah, I don't need all that. Uh, from Thornton Page. 
Subject, termination of NASA contract NASW-3023. Uh, enclosure A, the final report on analysis of Apollo 16 and Skylab ultraviolet camera data. Dated 30 June 1981, concludes contract NASW-3023 as required by Article 3 of blah, 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 blah. I'm sure those are useful numbers for people if they were doing research. Less useful for me at the moment, because they're just numbers. Four copies have been submitted, um, and there's an enclosure. Which is the final report. Uh, analysis of Apollo 16 and Skylab ultraviolet camera data. Summary. NASA con covers the period from uh, 1 December 1976 through 30 June 1981. The statement of work specified four tasks. Continuing the data analysis started in 1972 under a NASA grant to the Naval Research Laboratory, uh, these tasks are 1. Mapping the Large Magellanic Cloud. 2. Measuring UV magnitudes of early type stars. 3a, measuring UV flux from groups of, uh, and clusters of galaxies, and 3b, measuring UV flux from nebulae. Uh, the data were obtained with the S201 Far UV Camera slash Spectrograph from the U lunar surface on Apollo 16 and the S201 Far UV Camera on Skylab 4. For background, this instrument and its use are described in section 1 below, followed by a chronological account of work completed before 1 December 1976. <clears throat> Tables 2a and 3 list publications during that period. Section 2 continues the chronological account of work performed under uh, the contract and Table 2B lists publications during this period, of which the major ones are Revised S201 Catalog of Far UV Objects, Enclosure A, and Distributions of Hot Stars and Hydrogen in the Lower Magellan or Large Magellanic Cloud, Enclosure B, to this report. Data were! Indeed, Key Squared, it's good to see um, a proper plural attached there. It's just a satisfying thing to, like, Data. 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 It's a plural word. Um, the work under the contract was performed by Dr. Thornton Page with the volunteered cooperation of Drs. George R. Carruthers <coughs> and Harry M. Heckathorne of the Naval Research Laboratory, as noted below. Most of it involved use of the JSC uh, exec 8 computer system for which IMS computer funds were provided. Uh, da, 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 da. Some acknowledgments. Sorry, I don't know. The, the yawn came out of nowhere in the middle of a sentence or a, a word. Uh, let's see. Ooh! I like a diagram. Figure 1. Simplified cross-section diagram of the electro electronographic Schmidt camera. We have a focusing magnet. It looks like two focusing magnets. A corrector plate. <clears throat> Primary mirror. Photocathode. Electron image uh, uh, ends up on the barrier mem membrane, or possibly on the film transport. I'm not. I, I think. I think it ends up on the barrier membrane. Optical image. Oh, Nancy Roman mentioned at the bottom of the last page. Under the acknowledgments, doctors Nancy Roman, uh, Maurice Dubin, and Edward Weiler. Um, provided useful advice and encouragement, as did Drs. Herbert Friedman and Philip Manga and Dr. Michael Duke. As noted below, Page was greatly assisted by Richard Hill in the use of JSC computers. So uh, Dr. Nancy Roman is getting a new telescope named after her. 
It's good to have a diagram now and Ven. Detective, Detective Zen. Um, that deserves points. It is a space telescope. Or, oh, it's a space telescope being named after Nancy Roman. That's awesome. I was unaware of this, and that sounds... I... Yeah, we always run across interesting things in, in the NASA-related papers. Um, I don't think I have anything specifically related to her. But, you know, I have to check, right? No. I do not have any uh, Nancy Roman papers. Sadly. Or I'd be making a big deal out of it um, now knowing that a telescope is going to be named after her. The Ni Nancy Roman Infrared Space Telescope. Scheduled for launch in 2027. It's so shiny. That's awesome. And infrared... Uh, so she, this project was also in, or er, ultraviolet, so not infrared. Whatever. Still beyond the visual spectrum of humans. Uh, all right, I'm going to read some of this. In 1969, Carruthers and Page independently proposed the use of a far UV ultra, uh, the use of a far UV electrographic camera to obtain imagery and spectrograms of Earth's atmosphere, Geocorona, stars and galaxies from the lunar surface. Uh, this was approved as the S201 experiment in the Apollo program on 15 March 1970, with Carruthers, Carruthers as the principal and Page as co-investigator. Uh, co At that time, Page was a NAS research associate, uh, background, background. Uh, camera designed and built in prototype uh, formed by Carruthers uses an F <clears throat> F1.0 Schmidt camera of 7.5 centimeter aperture to focus light on a curved photocathode maintained at negative 25,000 volts. Reference figure one. I'm trying to um, let's see if I leave the image here on the screen. Come on. It's so hard to do, uh, because I make the adjustment and then I have to wait, like, three or four seconds before I can see if the adjustment was correctly done or not. Um. The photocathode is coated with potassium bromide, which is blind to wavelengths longer than 160 nanometers, but emits photoelectrons where struck by shorter wavelengths. Two Schmidt corrector plates are mounted on a rotable, or rotatable filter wheel in front, one of lithium fluoride, which transmits wavelengths longer than 105 nanometers, and the other of calcium fluoride, which transmits wavelengths longer than 125 nanometers. Now I know how NASA feels when they have to adjust the space telescopes. You're not wrong. Although their delay is significantly longer than mine. Um, <clears throat> a third hole in the filter wheel transmits all wavelengths when the camera is used in spectrographic mode. The photoelectrons, in hard vacuum, are focused by a cylindrical magnet around the camera, providing an axial field of 300 gauss and form the image on film coated with a thin layer of Kodak NTB3 nuclear track emulsion behind a 32 millimeter hole in the 12.5 centimeter spherical quartz mirror coated with rhenium. Uh, in order to cut out stray light, a thin 0.8 micron barrier membrane of plastic coated with aluminum uh, permeable, permeable to um, 25, I do not know this 
abbreviation, KEV. <clears throat> 25 KEV electrons, but opaque to light. Kiloelectric volts? I'm not certain what 25 KEV is. Uh, is placed across the hole and the 35 millimeter film pressed tightly against it. Uh, Kiloelectron volts. So I was close. Um, Uh, the electrograph's field is 20 degrees, the resolution about 3 arc minutes, and the photon efficiency about 5%. When used as a spectrograph, the camera is turned 90 degrees to view a 10 by 15 centimeter plane grating with uh, 1200 lines per, per millimeter, rhenium coated at a 45 degree angle with a grid collimiter limiting the field to 20 degrees by uh, 0 0.25 degrees. For use on the lunar surface, the camera slash spectrograph unit was mounted on a leveled azimuth circle on a 30 inch tripod with an altitude pivot, allowing the astronaut to point at designated altitude and azimuth positions. Motors were provided to turn the camera from imagery to spectrograph mode and back to rotate the filter wheel from a uh, lithium fluoride corrector to calcium fluoride? Yep. Corrector to open hole and to actuate the film, film transport. When the astronaut pressed the power on switch or reset switch, these mechanisms ran through the following sequence of exposures timed by film advance. Um, yeah. Oh, Hannah, thank you for dropping that link to the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. Uh, you should also be able to drop that link on the other channel if you wish to try. I believe I have that fixed so that you're able to post links. Um, so it uh, when they power it on, it automatically cycles through or cycled through a bunch of different um, pre-programmed photographs. Use on Apollo 16. After the S-201 experiment was approved in early 1970, a 15-man team was set up by Herbert Friedman, NRL code 7100, including Page as NRL representative at MSC to construct the flight hardware under blah, 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 blah. Page was to plan the use of the camera on the moon and to coordinate between uh, NRL and the MSC Engineering Division, Astronaut Office and Flight Operations Division. A detailed timeline was prepared, uh, da, 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 including deployment of the camera and pointing it at a series of astronomical objects ranging from the Earth and Geo Corona through two parts of the Milky Way and the Large Magellanic Cloud to clusters of galaxies. This selection of targets required circulation of their altitudes and azimuths from the Descartes landing site and allowance from sky or allowance for sky blocked by the nearby lunar module and distant mountains. <clears throat> for thermal reasons, the camera had to be in the shadow of the lunar module and the battery in sunlight. Oh, you just copied the link that Key Square dropped in the Discord? Well, thank you, Key Squared, for um, finding uh, or letting us know about NASA's um, the the Roman Infrared Space Telescope. Another problem was the need to keep the camera photocathode at relative humidity less than twenty five percent during transport to and storage at the Kennedy Space Center. I'm not going to comment on relative humidities. Um, those who watch my gaming streams might know where my brain went there. Uh, for this purpose, a protective bag was designed and fabricated by the crew systems section of the MSC engineering division to meet requirements set by NRL and the MSC astronaut office. Problem was finally solved by sealing the bag to the pallet on which the S-201 experiment was mounted. Uh, providing a humidity meter visible from the outside and two valves to allow purging the bag with dr dry nitrogen every two hours and installing two airtight rip cords with which the astronaut could open the bag on the lunar surface. <clears throat> uh, 
I'll just note uh, the, the comment about humidity is um, there are some humidity challenges in my office. And so reading about keeping constant relative humidity um, made me wistful for a moment. I'm going to zoom out just a bit. Uh, we have an image. This is um, a standard NASA image. I have not Googled the... Um, actually, I think I did Google the image number, and I did not find the standard caption. So uh, I don't know about modern NASA images, um, but I know uh, images from this era, from the Apollo era, um, they all have a number, so the number that's right there, AS16-114-18439, and there would be press kits with a set of images and associated pre-written captions for the images um, where NASA had their PR people writing descriptions of what was in the image. Um, and so you would refer to the number that is on the image and you would look to the um, mimeographed copy of the captions uh, to find the appropriate caption for the image. I, it, this was just included in this report. It doesn't have the associated captions with it and I have not um, uh, I did a quick Google of it, a quick internet search of the image number um, when I was doing or preparing promotional materials for this episode, and I did not find the standard caption for it. So I don't know uh, who the astronaut in the image is. Um, this just says figure two, S201 camera slash spectrograph on the moon. Uh, let me see in the report where figure two is mentioned and see if it says who it is. Um, there was mention that John Young was on this mission um, elsewhere, but I don't know if that is John in the picture. I haven't seen where figure two is referenced in the, in the write-up. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I don't see it. I don't see the azimuths. Astronaut training took place at MSC, and the Apollo 16 commander was chosen to deploy and operate the S201 experiment. Uh, so this is the Apollo, it isn't you, uh, so that rules out one person. Um, so this is an image from the moon, and it was the commander of the mission, uh, the Apollo 16 mission, who was chosen to actually deploy and operate the experiment. So this is astronaut John Young. Um, Astronaut Young elected to open the protective bag while the pallet was in place on the right side of Quad 3 in the lunar module. Remove the four pip pins, uh, pip pins that secured the camera to the pallet. Lift the camera out. Remove three more pip pins that held the tripod legs in folded position. Unfold the legs and deploy the camera near the edge of the lunar module's shadow with the silver cell battery on its 12-foot cable in sunlight. Because it was important to keep the camera in shadow and the battery in sunlight, Page made elaborate pre-flight studies of the L lunar module shadow and its change with time during deployment on 21-22 April 1972. After leveling the azimuth circle, Young set the zero point by sighting down sun as described in SP-315, the Apollo 16 preliminary science report. Chapter 13, and each target uh, pointing was specified by degrees of altitude and azimuth to be set on the camera circles. One exception was the second target, Earth, for which a special optical sight was provided on the camera. Hence, the Earth was the best centered of the ten targets, as shown in Table 1 below. Um, I don't know. Do we have Table 1? 
I don't see a table. I'd love more images. So I had, when I was looking through this and I read about the experiments, I was like, do we have any of the images that were taken by the camera? I have yet to locate any of those images in this collection. Um, but there is an image of the uh, far UV um, pictures of Earth that can be found on the NASA image website. Um, and that I actually used for the promotional materials this week because I took the image that we had of Paige uh, with, you know, in profile with the eye patch <coughs> and sort of mashed it up together with the image that was taken of the Earth, which is a black and white image. Um, let's see, there's some pictures here. This is pictures of Earth. Don't you recognize Earth? Um, does it discuss how long the telescope functioned? I will look. But we do have, in this report, we've got, these are images of Earth. So while I'm looking at the other one to see if it says how long the telescope functioned, uh, we'll just throw up here. This is the far ultraviolet imaging of Earth as taken um, using the camera on the moon during the Apollo 16 mission. I only know it's Earth because I looked at images because I needed an image for the promotional stuff. see. <clears throat> Actually, I'm just going to keep reading from this report because we only have like five minutes left. So you look at these pictures. I'm going to read from this report. Uh, after leveling the azimuth circle, Young set the zero point by sighting down sun as described in SP315, the Apollo 16 preliminary science report, chapter 13, and each target pointing was specified by degrees of altitude and azimuth to be set on the camera circles. One exception was the second target, Earth, for which a special optical sight was provided on the camera. Hence, the Earth was the best centered of the 10 targets, as shown in Table 1 below. The descent to the lunar, surf lunar surface was delayed six hours due to mechanical problems, so the sun was higher than planned. The camera had to be deployed closer to the lunar module uh, to be in the shade, and two targets, uh, ABLE 2634 cluster of galaxies and the NGC 7317 group Stefan's Quintet, blocked by the lunar module, had to be dropped. Uh, starting at 1752 Greenwich Mean Time on 21 April 1972, Young pointed the S201 camera at 11 targets, identified in Enclosure A, revised, to, uh, revised S201 catalog of far UV objects, by constellation names for periods ranging from 33 minutes to 16 hours and 52 minutes. A total of 209 frames were exposed on the 35mm NTB3 film, 19 of them during calibration at NRL and 190 on the moon. As shown in Table 1, the film ran out before the final pointing at the NGC-134 group of galaxies in Sculptor. Uh, the film container was removed from the camera and returned for processing at MSC. MSC was later renamed the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center, JSC. Of the 190 frames exposed on the moon, 48 were direct imagery through the LIF corrector plate, which with the uh, potassium bromide photocathode, sorry, uh, 48 were direct imagery through the lithium fluoride corrector plate, which with the potassium bromide photocathode covers the spectral range from 105 to 160 nanometers designated um, ILI in table one and enclosure A. Another 45 frames were exposed through the calcium fluoride corrector plate, spectral range 125 to 160 nanometers. 36 frames were spectra through the lithium fluoride corrector, and 35 frames were spectra through no corrector, spectral range 58 to 160 nanometers. 
Um, the other 26 frames were wasted during transitions between imagery and spectrographic modes. The processed film was carried by Page to Minneapolis in late May 1972 for densitometer scans uh, by Dicomed Corp, but these measures were very noisy. Uh, work stopped during July and August 1972 due to Page's heart attack on 29 July or 29 June. Apollo 16 data analysts or data analysis uh, funded by NASA grant to NRL DPR was further delayed by the Skylab 4 mission. So I don't see that this particular camera was used other than on the moon. There was there was a um, the same kind of camera used on Skylab. But it was the backup camera. They modified the backup camera from the Apollo 16 mission, and that's the one that went to Skylab 4. Uh, so the actual operation of the far ultraviolet camera uh, on the Apollo 16 mission, uh, which would be the total time that that camera was operated apart from um, like setup and testing and, and whatnot pre-mission uh, was detailed in here. And I read it. Um, so I don't know for sure. Uh, there were a total of 209 frames taken uh, with that camera and the observation periods were between 33 minutes and 16 hours and 52 minutes. Uh, so it doesn't say, at least not in the written report, um, the total amount of time that the camera was in operation. Let me see if table one has it. I also need to get my uh, pages in order here. Page two, page three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There. Um, table one. Um, so we could figure it out because this table includes, uh, it goes from 1752 to 1824, 1825 to 2311. Um, so we would just have to calculate the times to, to know its full operation because it didn't, uh, it's not like it was like the Hubble telescope or something where it ran for like years beyond its design life. Uh, this camera went up on the Apollo 16 mission and as far as I can tell from this report, never went up again and was never used after the mission. It may have been, um, but that would require research to confirm. Uh, but there was no indication in this report that it had, had been used or that they had plans to use it after this mission. Because uh, the Skylab camera was the backup camera from this mission. So with a little bit math on those um, times, uh, you could get your, your full answer there, be open sky. Um, but it looks like they're, they're, what they ended up imaging were in, let's see, the first one was in Cygnus, the second was in Capricorn, three, I think that's SETI. I'm not sure. The three letter abbreviations for constellations, I'm, uh, GRU? I don't know GRU as a three letter abbreviation for a constellation. Uh, 
Looks like 47 hours and 50 minutes. Thank you for mathing because um, I could have taken the time, but honestly, it's probably faster with you doing it. Uh, so of the 11 targets, they managed to image 10 of them. Uh, the first was Loop and North America Nebulae. There's a North America Nebula? Uh, Earth and Air Glow. NGC 1068 Group. Apparently they missed the, the target on uh, the third one. Grus and NGC 55 Groups of Galaxies. Grus, the crane, Southern Hemisphere Constellation. That's probably part of why I don't know it. I, in North America, we don't, we don't learn the Southern Hemisphere Constellations very well. I don't know Be Open Sky. Um, I will look and see if there's anything that says, I am gross. Um, the Pavo group of galaxies, the Large Magellanic Cloud, NGC 6300 group of galaxies, Geo Corona east of Earth, Fornax cluster of galaxies, Milky Way Center, and the one that they didn't have time for was the NGC 134 group of galaxies. Not that they didn't have time, they didn't have enough um, film. They ran out of film. Um, it, honestly, it doesn't say for certain, but I assumed that it stayed on the moon. Based on the way, based on the way the experiment was described in the report. Uh, it ends with, as shown in table one, the film ran out before the final pointing of the NGC 134 group of, or at the NGC 134 group of galaxies in Sculptor. The film container was removed from the camera and returned for processing. Which implies to me that the only thing that was returned was the film container and that the rest of the camera, camera stayed on the moon. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing the link to the North America Nebula. I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, so that is that is how I read that, is that, um, that the cameras stayed there and they only brought back the film container. The North America Nebula, NGC 7000, or Caldwell 20, is an emission nebula in the constellation Cygnus, close to Deneb the tail of the swan and its brightest star. The shape of the nebula resembles that of the continent North America with a prominent Gulf of Mexico. <coughs> <coughs> so it's named after the shape, which makes sense. Because we've named others, other nebulas after their shape, like the Crab Nebula is named because it looks somewhat like a crab from our viewing angle. So interesting. I did, I wasn't aware of that one. Um, <clears throat> okay. I need to put this report uh, back into its plastic clip. Um, we didn't get to his speeches, but honestly, uh, this report was pretty interesting to me. I, I don't miss the speeches at this moment. There were some interesting speeches that I sort of saw. It's weird. I, I don't know this collection. Like, oh dear. Oh bother. Um, I, I have made an error. Hold please. Uh, it, this is an unusual error. Not an unpredictable error, given that I had two reports out at the same time. Generally not something that we encourage. 
I, I had gotten the two reports sort of mixed, and I'm correcting that now. Um, <clears throat> I enjoyed uh, learning about this. I, um, this wasn't a very image-rich collection, so I ended up having to look at more of the materials before the stream than I normally do, uh, which is the only reason that I am talking about, like, oh, I know there were some pretty interesting things in the speeches, because while I had it out, I opened up the speeches folder. On the off chance, there was something, like, in his handwriting that was visually interesting. Um, because, yeah, I don't, I, I try not to spend a lot of time sort of learning the collection before the stream, because we like to discover it together. Anyway, let's, let's close out for the day, and, um, I'm glad that, I'm glad that you, uh, found it fun. I, and fascinating, I, I actually thought it was kind of interesting, um, his biography, he was physically near many of the events of World War II, apparently. Uh, narrowly missed dying uh, on the Andrea Doria. Just connected so many things. So many things. <laughs> Oh, the open sky. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, we're here every Wednesday, um, starting at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and it runs for about two hours. Um, and I just share things from the archives here at uh, Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, <clears throat> that, is, that is the Wednesday stream. Um, that said, after I say we're here every Wednesday, uh, we have two more before the university is closed down for winter break. Uh, so the final Wednesday of the year, the 28th of December, there will not be an episode. But next Wednesday, 2.30 p.m., right here on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios or twitch.tv slash Rogan27, uh, I will be joined by Kira, one of the other archivists here at Virginia Tech, and we're going to talk about... Baking Advertisements. The title of the episode, Baking Ads, The Good, The Bad, and The Sad. Uh, so we've selected items from our collections that are advertisements for baking or baked goods, uh, including some recipe information and things like that. And we're going to take a look at them and critique... Um, the ads. It should be a fun time. Um, also, this is, like, so far, just once a year, I have a guest on, and uh, we're not baking the advertisements. No. Um, no, we're not. Anyway, uh, do we want fish or games? Where are we going for the raid? Um, <clears throat> let me see what's available. <laughs> Fisher games! Fisher games! Games. Uh, sure. That... I believe will end up... Thanks, pal. Ah! <laughs> I wanted that to be muted. Um, presently, game-wise, we we generally pop on over to, like, uh, Stephen Joy's... Uh, if I want to do games, because Steven is awesome. Um, and yeah, we could do that. It's Vampire Survivors, it looks like. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and set up those raids. Do, do, do. Ah! I can't type because you all are watching me. But don't go away. We're, we're going to raid on over to uh, Stephen Joyce, a wonderful variety streamer, um, wears tiny hats, uh, has 
many, many librarians um, in, in his community. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's just generally a lovely person. Um, so uh, when we get over there, if you wouldn't mind saying hi, that'd be awesome. Uh, but we are going to head on over there. Thank you all for joining me for an adventure in the archives today. Um, and I hope I see you again soon. Until I do, um, stay curious and keep exploring history.